Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video for the required practicals that are going to be in the AQA Combined Science Higher Exam and this video looks at Biology Paper 1. If you're not sure if you're watching the right video then please do check with your teacher. This is for combined scientists who are doing the trilogy version of the course which means you'll do six exams all of which are one hour and 15 minutes long. So the required practicals we're going to go through are food tests, enzymes and photosynthesis because these are the ones the examiners have said will come up in the exam. Do keep an eye on the description as well because I hope to add a link to some questions there a little bit later on on these required practicals and I'll also put the link to the content for this exam in there as well. Food tests required practical. So there's three food tests you need to be aware of. Um, in your revision guide, they may talk about a test for fats as well using Sudan 3. Um, however, because that's quite a nasty chemical, they've they've removed that as, as part of the required practical. So you shouldn't be asked on f fats, you should just be asked on carbohydrates, which split into complex carbohydrates like starch and simple carbohydrates like sugar, and then uh, protein. But first of all, you need to prepare your food sample and you do this by crushing up your food um, in here using a pestle and mortar. And then you'd mix it with a little bit of water in a test tube or a boiling tube to make a food solution. So we could do three different tests. We could do a test for starch. So if we have our uh, food solution in here, so the test for starch is to add iodine and if iodine um, detects starch there will be a colour change from orange to black. So if this food sample contains starch it would turn black. So to test for sugar we put some of our food um, solution inside a test tube and we would add Benedict's solution. Benedict's solution is blue. Um, but importantly, we also have to put this in a water bath. So you could either heat it up and try and maintain the, te maintain the temperature, or you could use an electronic water bath. And it needs to be around 75 degrees C, so quite a hot uh, water bath. And a positive result, if we put our um, Benedict's inside, heat it up in the, in the water bath, a positive result would be a change from blue to orange. Now you will, may well see in your revision guide other um, colours as well because if it's got a little bit of sugar in it might go a green colour, if it's got a lot of sugar in it might go orange or maybe even a, a brick red colour. Okay so in the exam they might talk about green, orange or, or brick, brick red but if in doubt remember blue to orange. So to test for protein, our final food test, we would add a food sample into our test tube. And the test for protein is to add Biorette solution. And that's quite a light blue solution that we add in. And that will turn to purple. Okay, it's quite a light purple, that's why I put light purple, but you still get the mark if you put um, purple in there as well. So if protein's present, you will get the colour change from blue to purple. Enzymes required practical. For this required practical, you will investigate the effect of pH on the rate of enzyme activity. So, what we do first of all, if I take you through step by step, is we would heat a water bath to 37 degrees and place a boiling tube inside containing some amylase. So, I've just given some suggested amounts here, so 7 centimetres cubed for example of amylase and 25 centimetres cubed of a pH buffer and we'll start off with for example pH 3. So in this test tube we've got amylase going in there and also a pH buffer which will all mix together. Now a pH buffer is just a, uh, a solution which has an exact pH. In this case we're starting at pH 3, so something that your science could, technicians could make up for you. 
Now we want to heat that up to 37 degrees or thereabouts. In your exam they might talk about 35 or 40, but around that kind of temperature because this is body temperature and that is the optimum temperature for enzymes. So amylase is the enzyme we're going to look at and we are going to then also at the same time prepare a spotting tile, which is this piece of equipment at the bottom here, by dropping a couple of drops of iodine into each well. And iodine is actually a um, browny orange colour. So first of all, our wells will look all orange, like so, with a couple of drops in each one. So we'll prepare that and just put it to one side. Our next step is to add five centimetres cubed of starch to the boiling tube and immediately start the stopwatch. So amylase, if you remember, breaks down starch. So we will add our starch into the bo boiling tube and immediately start our timer. Now, every 30 seconds, we are going to do um, continuous sampling. This is a method which so shows continuous sampling. And every 30 seconds, we are going to take a small sample of our mixture here, which contains our starch, our amylase and our pH 3 buffer, first of all. And we are going to drop that on our wells. So every 30 seconds, remove a small sample of the mixture in the boiling tube using a pipette and add a couple of drops to one well on the spotting tile. Now, in the first stages, our spotting tile well should go black because of the presence of starch, because starch turns iodine black. Now, this will keep going for a while. And then after a while, it might go a browny kind of colour, okay, to show that there's a little bit of black in there still, but a lot less than before, maybe into a light brown. And then eventually, after a while, it will remain orange. So if we continue to sample, the wells would just remain orange because that would suggest that the amylase has completely broken down the starch. So we would repeat the previous step until the colour of the well remains orange and then we would stop the stopwatch and record the time. Now we can actually convert this into a rate by doing the following equation, rate equals a thousand divided by time and this is the only calculation we can do when we have a colour change because you can't have such thing as colour change over time so we just make the numbers a little bit simpler by doing a thousand divided by time. So that will give us a time it takes for the enzyme amylase to break down starch keeping the temperature constant, that's a control variable and we've used one of our buffers, our pH3 buffer. Now this is our independent variable that we are going to change and our rate is our dependent variable. So the final thing we need to do is repeat the investigation but for different pH buffers, for example 5, 8 and 13. And within the experiment what we want to do is then finally repeat the whole thing three times and calculate a mean rate of reaction, which I'll just put as rate, for each pH. Measuring the rate of photosynthesis required practical. In this practical, we submerge some pondweed in water and the number of bubbles it gives off per minute gives us a rate of photosynthesis and the investigation looks normally at how light intensity affects the rate of photosynthesis by moving a lamp closer or further away. For example, if you had your lamp far away pointing at the pondweed, you might get a few bubbles coming off in that minute. If you then moved it closer, you might get a few more bubbles given off 
in that minute. If you moved it closer again, increasing the light intensity that's reaching the pond weed, in that minute you may well get a few more bubbles giving off, indicating a higher rate of photosynthesis as you move the lamp closer to the pond weed. So let me run through the main steps of the practical that you need to get down if asked to write a method. Cut 10 centimetres of pond weed and submerge this in water in a boiling tube. Clamp the boiling tube to a clamp stand. I haven't shown this here, but you may well have um, set up a clamp stand just to make sure that stays in the right position, clamping it there like so. Measure 50 centimetres away from the clamp stand using a ruler and place a lamp here directed at the pond weed. Turn on a stopwatch. Record the number of bubbles produced by the pond weed in one minute. Repeat this experiment for the following distances. 40 centimetres, make sure you list them. 30 centimetres, 20 centimetres, 10 centimetres. Each time recording the number of bubbles produced by the pond weed in one minute. So our variables are important here. Our independent variable is the distance between the lamp and the pond weed. The dependent variable is the number of bubbles per minute. And important control variables, things like type of pond weed, the length of pond weed, the power of the lamp you're using. For example, you, you might want to say you're going to keep it at a 40 watt bulb or something like that. And the temperature. Now, with regards to temperature, you may well see a transparent heat shield in front of the lamp, which will um, stop the lamp from heating up the water or you may well see that the investigation makes sure it uses an LED lamp, a light emitting diode rather than the filament lamp and that will um, reduce the heat given off and therefore help you control the temperature in the experiment. Okay, the inverse square law is for high tier pupils only. If you were doing foundation, the relationship that you need to know is the further the lamp is away from the pond weed, the lower the light intensity. So really at a foundation level you'd need to know as distance increases the light intensity decreases. However for higher tier you need to know a very um, specific relationship between distance and light intensity Yes, it's true that as, light as distance increases, the light intensity will decrease, but it's got a very special relationship in that light intensity is proportional to 1 over distance squared. So we talk about light intensity being inversely proportional, which means 1 over the distance squared.